Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive, and welcome to our weekly Westchester update. It's Monday, March 21st, and we're very uh, happy to have here today with us the town supervisor from the town of Mount Pleasant. I'll bring him up in a second or two, Carl Fulgenzi, who will talk a little bit about his community. As you know, every week when we give these updates, we invite one of the town supervisors, village mayors, or city mayors to join us and uh, give you a little slice of the mosaic that makes up Westchester County. Uh, the town of Mount Pleasant uh, is a very large town, and it includes uh, two and a half villages and hamlets. So it's a very diverse area to manage, and the county has quite a bit of holdings out there. So uh, the supervisor has quite a lot of work on his hands, and we'll be happy to get an update on Mount Pleasant from him in a second. Uh, we will have uh, Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins joining us, as he always does, and also our County Attorney John Nona, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, litigation that we're involved with at Westchester County Airport. Whenever we talk about legal action, we have to be very circumspect about what we can say and what we can't say. Anything that's before a court of law is going to be very uh, particular. But we do want to let you know what's happening uh, in this particular area. And uh, if John has time, he may also mention some of the initiatives that we're doing to try to clean up some pollution there. Uh, it, the acronym is PFAS. It represents a chemical uh, that has seeped the groundwater going back almost 40 years at the airport. Uh, but some of that work also has fallen into his office. So the county attorney's office is doing a lot of good work in this general area. And then we'll touch on union contracts and a few other things just to keep you updated on what's happening in Westchester County. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, town supervisor of the town of Mount Pleasant, Carl Fulgenzi, uh, has been in office for a number of years. He has served uh, his town, very popular in his community. And as I mentioned just a second ago, it is a diverse community. It has uh, sizable hamlets that we all don't know the names of, uh, Valhalla, Hawthorne, Thornwood. Uh, it includes Pocanico Hills, which is one of the most um, upscale addresses, the, uh, the home of the Rockefeller Estate. That falls within Mount Pleasant. Kensico Dam Plaza is in the town of Mount Pleasant, and so is the new complex that's going up right next to Kingsland Park in Sleepy Hollow, because the village of Sleepy Hollow, the village of Pleasantville, and part of the village of Briarcliff Manor all fall within the town. So uh, a lot of work falls at the desk of the town supervisor. There's development going on there, and uh, delivery of basic services, so I'm going to invite him to give you an update on the town of Mount Pleasant, the Honorable Carl Fulgenzi. Carl, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, George. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, first, I'd like to thank <coughs> George uh, and Westchester County. Can, can we go back a little bit further? And John Nona, it's always been a pleasure to work with you from the village and on now with the county. Um, town of Mount Pleasant is a very diverse town. Uh, and very large. Uh, we've always had a very good working relationship with Westchester County. Through the whole COVID situation, it was a, a challenge for everyone, and we appreciate everything that the county has done to help us with PPEs and other things that we had needed to get through that area. Uh, Mount Pleasant was established in 1788. We celebrated our bicentennial in 1988 with a year-long celebration with uh, parades, uh, dinners, light shows, it was, it was quite an event, and culminating with a time-set capsule that was buried outside of Town Hall, which will be opening in 100 years. I don't know if I'll be able to make that one, but I'm sure someone will. <clears throat> I, I was very proud to be part of that whole celebration, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, Mount Pleasant continues on that track that we are very proud of in our past. The town of Mount Pleasant, as George had stated, is centrally located in, in the county of Westchester. We were known for our rolling hills that open land. Uh, one of our largest parkland in the town of Mount Pleasant is the Rockefeller State Park, which is over 1,700 acres of land, which is beautiful, and many, many people take the opportunity to walk through that beautiful park. We have a total land area of 32.7 square miles, 27.7 is land area, and five square miles is water, which is the Kensico Reservoir, which supplies water to our area and to New York City. Our borders extend from the Hudson River to Briarcliff Manor, Chappaqua, Armonk, and North White Plains. We have a population of about 44,000 people. Our highway department maintains about 120 lane miles of road. We have a total of 13,982 parcels with 10,800 are residential, 3,150 are commercial. Some of our large commercial office parks include Pepsi 
the Fuji Corporation, Regeneron, and coming soon, the Amazon uh, is in the process of building a very large warehouse distribution center on Route 9A in Hawthorne. We have eight local school districts in the town of Mount Pleasant and two state school districts. Approximately 30% of the land in the town of Mount Pleasant is tax exempt. Good percentage of that is cemeteries. We're very big on cemeteries in Mount Pleasant. We are comprised with the unincorporated hamlets like George had mentioned. We have Hawthorne, Bowen, Valhalla, and Pecanico Hills. And we have the villages of Pleasantville, Sleepy Hollow, and a small portion of Briarcliff Manor. <clears throat> we have two major medical facilities, the Westchester County Medical Center and Phelps Memorial Hospital over in Sleepy Hollow. New York Medical College with the more recently approved Toro Dental School, which was the first dental school that was approved in over 50 years. And we have it here right in Mount Pleasant. We have the expanded campus of Pace University. The former IBM Training Center in Thornwood uh, was sold at one point to the Legionnaires of Christ. Uh, more recently, a portion of that land was sold to EF Academy, which is a private boarding school, which put that portion back on the tax rolls. The balance of that land, we are presently talking with a developer to develop it into possibly townhouses for age-appropriate residents. Uh, the sale of that property will give Mount Pleasant an initial 20 acres of land, which we are hoping to expand our recreational facilities, uh, possibly adding a senior pool with a recreation building so that all the places that we presently rent to operate our camps will be able to be in one location. Instead of paying rent, we'll be putting it towards our debt. Also looking for possibility of uh, indoor pool, which we could rent out, we have, I have a lot of uh, great visions, and I'm hoping the community will back me on those thoughts. <laughs> the, uh, by moving our recreation department out of our lower level, our police department, which is ever really always growing and needing more space, we would be able to move the police department to take the whole downstairs, and the recreation department could be wholly up at our community center area. Also, uh, getting our parks department out of the highway department, give the highway department more room, and bring them up to that area also. We uh, presently are in the final stages of our master plan, uh, which includes the revitalization of the hamlets of Hawthorne, Bowen, and Valhalla. Uh, mainly it's upgrading pedestrian walkways, roadways, sidewalks, uh, curbing and all that, plantings to try to dress up these hamlets. Not much has been done in our hamlets in probably 50 years, so it's it's about time we address it. It's it's a long process, as we know, the legal, the zoning, and everything else gets involved in people's opinions, change the course of getting these done, things done. So we're hoping that we're, we're presently getting there. Uh, I'm in conversations with Con Edison right now in the hopes of possibly burying all the electric lines that run through our hamlets of Hawthorne and Fallwood. If we're renovating buildings and adding some beautiful buildings, having those wires running across the front of those buildings does not really add to the aesthetics of the area. Some of our revitalization funds had come uh, through the efforts of former Senator Terrence Murphy and the, uh, the IDA, which will be also assisting on a lot of these projects will help put funding into those. The proposed development of the North 60 um, is something that the county has a 99-year lease with <clears throat> the Ferrari Associates. That's something that uh, we're looking forward to getting that project moving as soon as we can. Uh, the, that site will also require water, uh, additional water. The county right now has a, a water tank off on, that, off on the county property. <clears throat> we have found that that tank could use some work. We're looking to put another tank nearby, have interconnection, create a redundant supply, allow the county to redo their tank while we supply water that's needed for that area. The Mount Pleasant IDA is responsible for assisting Regeneron, uh, the ongoing expansion of Regeneron, and the uh, PepsiCo project. Uh, I was advised 
previous administration that Pepsi had advised that they were thinking of leaving town of Mount Pleasant. We set up a meeting with them, and the idea was able to work out a plan with PepsiCo to keep them in Mount Pleasant and also entice them to add on to the research and development facilities in the town of Mount Pleasant. Uh, that during that Pepsi settlement, at the time the Valhalla School District had owed over 700,000 in tax surcharges and the town owed like 200,000. In our negotiations with PepsiCo, we were able to wipe that out, saving the school and the town close to a million dollars. <throat> we are now seeing that some of our new uh, ideas for the downtown are starting to come to fruition. Some of our property owners are working on revitalizing some of their buildings. And when you see your neighbor fixing up their building, they think about redoing theirs. So it's, it, it multiplies. And we're starting to see this happen in, in our downtowns. And we're, this is something that we really want to see continue. Uh, again, Mount Pleasant is very proud of our relationship with West County, the things that we have done together, and we look forward to the future working with the county. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. That is Carl Fulgenzi, who is the town supervisor for the town of Mount Pleasant. A very thorough report. And uh, Westchester County has a very significant presence in the town of Mount Pleasant. The Grasslands Campus, which houses many of our major facilities, falls within the town. Uh, that is where we have our police academy, our fire training academy. Uh, the Westchester County Jail is located there. The Westchester Medical Center, which is no longer a direct part of county government, it was once a department of the county, uh, but now it's an independent hospital facility, falls into that campus. We have our labs and research operation. We have Woodfield Cottage which houses uh, uh, young people who are to be incarcerated separately from those in a jail setting. Uh, and uh, we have our, one of our major bus garages there uh, in Valhalla. So there's really a strong presence there. And the North 60 that uh, the supervisor alluded to is 60 acres of land that the county has, which we have leased out to a developer to uh, develop what we hope will be a, a bioscience complex that will attract uh, corporations and uh, appropriate development, given the fact that Regeneron is nearby, the medical center and the uh, New York Medical Hos uh, pardon me, New York Medical College is there for medical school and dental school. All of those things fit together into that complex. So we have a, a future ahead of us that involves Mount Pleasant. Again, Carl, thank you for being with us today. We appreciate it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Ken Jenkins joins me for our update on COVID-related information. And um, in general, the numbers uh, on COVID are um, up a very slight bit uh, over the last week to 10 days, but uh, really not a significant number and still compares very favorably to where we were a month ago today. As of the information uh, we had through yesterday, 1,165 active cases of coronavirus in Westchester County. A month ago, that number was 1,452. So over the course of a month, there's a reduction of about 300 cases. Um, however, that number of 1,165 was lower uh, about two weeks ago when we were down in the vicinity of about 800, almost 700 cases. So that number has risen just a bit. The hospitalization numbers, however, have dropped dramatically. 106 cases a month ago, hospitalized 33 cases most recently, and that number is the lowest that we've had uh, literally in months. And the fatality numbers have still worked to our benefit. A month ago, we lost 16 people within the week. That included uh, February 20th. We have lost three individuals this week. Every death is a tragedy. In this case, uh, when we have that much of a diminution of 16 losses in a week down to three, uh, we think that is a good sign. However, the infection rate or the positivity rate is a little higher th this week than it was uh, a month ago. We had a 2.1% infection rate, positivity rate. That's a relatively small number, but it was even lower than that a month ago at 1.6%. So we're going to monitor the numbers. Uh, the slight uptick has been uh, discussed in some of the media outlets, and uh, we think it's it's worth uh, bears worth watching. But it does not mean we're going to change any of our strategies along that line. Now I'm going to have Ken talk a little bit about testing, and also uh, vaccinations. Thanks, George. And, and certainly, we're going to continue as the county executive pointed out the free testing that we have at Westchester County Center in White Plains. Those are specifically for symptomatic members of the community. 
those with a known exposure to a confirmed positive case, or those that wish to get tested for any reason at this point in time. We gotta keep reminding folks that the CDC recommends being tested <coughs> five to seven days after an exposure, right? And the appointments encourage, but walk-ins are certainly more than welcome. So we certainly wanna continue to make sure that everyone understands that the oper um, hours of operation for testing are Monday and Tuesdays, eight to four, Wednesdays, eight to 12, Thursdays, eight to two, and Fridays, eight to, um, eight to 12 noon. And again, um, appointments are encouraged, but walk-ins are certainly welcome for, the, for that particular thing for COVID testing. It's PCR testing. And as uh, we've been watching and the county executive pointed out, um, there's the variants that are happening in the BA2 variant from Omicron um, that's happening overseas. And usually we have about a three week lead time before the, we start seeing impacts here um, in the states. But again, we wanna continually be um, optimistic, but I'm um, paying attention to that. And that's why, whether it's testing and the free test kits that the county has given out, the county executive has made sure that we've given them out at different locations, certainly our municipal partners, um, the supervisor for Gen Z and, and the people in Mount Pleasant, being one of those in DPWs around the county, every municipality participated, and that's great work um, in the cooperation and coordination with everyone working together. Um, vaccinations, the county center continues to be open for vaccinations for those five and up. Those appointments are absolutely necessary on the um, health department's website. Um, again, especially for the five-year-olds, five up until the people are 17, 18 years old, you need a parent or a guardian to be able to accompany those individuals when those are happening. Um, you, you definitely wanna make sure to look at the health department website to get the accurate information on those pediatric, pediatric vaccinations. Um, we did see that there is a, an, an opportunity with Moderna that they're applying to get a, another shot, a fourth shot to continue to make sure that you have the level of protection that's necessary. And again, that's what con constitutes fully vaccinated. County Executive is extremely um, focused on making sure people have the right terminology. Making sure you're fully vaccinated, that means that you, in some cases, have a second, if you had Johnson & Johnson shot or um, Moderna or um, Pfizer, you have a third shot, you're boosted. That means that you're fully vaccinated. And again, these things change and when we get, if we get to a place like we have annual flu shots, um, we may have the, the same number of vaccinations that have to happen to keep us fully vaccinated and protected as best as we can um, to do that. We continue to have our vaccination satellite locations. We had them over the weekend um, in Yonkers, um, at the Yonkers Riverfront Library. Um, it was a special kind of opportunity, and then that was a great thing with the Yonkers Riverfront Library, the partnership between um, the city of Yonkers, specifically the Yonkers Public Library, and um, our, our team of individuals that do these satellite locations. Outstanding. Coming up this week, um, on the 23rd, we only have the booster clinics on the 23rd and the 24th. So Thursday and Friday, those uh, satellite locations are um, the County Center Booster Clinic 1 to 4. And on the 24th, we're going to have shots by appointment only, pediatric shots by appointment from 3 to 6.30. Um, and then the 25th, on Friday, the County Center Pediatrics um, um, vaccinations from 2.30 to 6.30 on Friday the 25th, we'll have the boosters from 1 to 6 p.m. So again, we gotta continue to do that particular work. Giving the heads up for the following leak we, like we like to do is that we'll have um, a New Rochelle, um, a New Rochelle clinic at their high school um, gym. Um, first shot, second shots and boosters, that's next week on the 30th. And again, we're gonna to continue to have these vaccination satellite locations happen at various places where we're able to look across the numbers and see where the numbers are low and try to help increase those. We certainly have seen that the, um, the boosters are not as, um, uh, people have not done those same things. 90, over 90% 90 of the people have had at least one shot. Um, again, to continue to have as much protection as possible, you need to go for um, the 
the booster shots to make sure that you're fully vaccinated. That may be second shot or third shots. Remember that there's a bunch of folks now that have come up to a full year after their very first vaccination shot and all the recommendations, whether that's for Pfizer, Moderna, or for Johnson & Johnson, that from four months to six months after that first shot, you're eligible and you should get that second shot, just like the county executive, myself, and almost all the members of our team here, fully boosted, vaccinated, and going forward. Back to you, George. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, COVID continues to be an important issue for us, but it is not the only issue that we want to highlight, and that's why we want these weekly updates to cover a variety of issues. I've asked our county attorney, John Nona, to join us today. We have a number of issues that relate to Westchester County Airport, and for those who live near the airport or under the flight path of the airport, it is an ongoing public policy matter. If you live elsewhere in the county, beyond that particular corridor, then uh, the county airport is a valuable transportation hub, which you may use from time to time. Maybe you use it regularly, but you don't necessarily think about it every day in the same way that if you live in one part of the county, you may not think of the presence of an Amtrak station in New Rochelle or Yonkers or Croton Harmon. But uh, the airport also represents uh, certain different challenges that we have, and many of those challenges have found their way into a court of law, which is why we ask our county attorney to give you an update. So the three issues that I've asked John Nona to touch on today. The first one is a lawsuit in which we are defending our prerogative as a county government to make a decision about whether or not to grant uh, an additional uh, hangar at the airport for a fixed-based operator, millionaire, uh, in which uh, there were some issues at hand. He'll explain those. The second is a lawsuit that we have launched in order to maintain our prerogative to protect our terminal use agreement. And then the third issue is uh, the work that we're trying to do to make sure that there is no PFAS pollution uh, in the drinking watershed. So I'm going to ask John Nona to join us here at the podium. Thank you, County Executive. So the Westchester County Airport, in addition to having commercial airlines operate out of the airport, there are fixed-based operators that essentially have hangars and sell jet fuel to aircraft either light aviation aircraft, small aircraft owned by private parties, charter aircraft owned by charter groups, uh, and corporate aircraft as well. And in, in connection with that, there are leases. We lease that property subject to leases. One of the uh, fixed base operators uh, was given the right under its lease to build, to expand a hangar to about 50,000 square feet and to refurbish <coughs> its terminal and it claimed it was able to build an additional very large hangar of 78,000 square feet under that lease. In our reading in the law department of that lease, that was not permitted under the lease. That would require a lease amendment and board of legislators approval. Uh, and so we opposed that. We denied the right to build that hangar because it wasn't permitted under the lease. That fixed-based operated millionaire decided to sue the county, claiming it had the right to build that hangar and that the county acted in bad faith by now allowing them to do that. The court recently ruled that the county <coughs> acted in accordance with its rights under the lease in not per permitting the construction of that hangar and did not act in bad faith in not allowing that hangar to be built, that 78,000 square fair hangar. Now um, there is an additional claim in the suit that is going forward and that has to do with the design of the stormwater management system and the construction of that system that was required to be built by Millionaire. The county will be answering that part of the complaint and will move forward with that litigation. And we feel confident that we will show the county acted in good faith in connection with that stormwater management system. The second litigation that the county executive referred to has to do with a new business model operated by certain charter operators who are called public charter operators, who essentially sell seats to the public on chartered aircraft with more than nine seats, just like a commercial airlines does. And we've determined that these public charter operators are operating in violation of our terminal use regulations. Those regulations are actually incorporated into county law, section 712.462 of the county charter. And th those terminal use regulations were actually approved by the Federal Aviation Administration back in 2004 when they were enacted. 
So in order to enforce those regulations, we are seeking a court order, and we brought a lawsuit in New York State Supreme Court, Westchester County, seeking a court order that those terminal use regulations are binding on these public charter operators who are essentially operating like a commercial airline in selling seats to the, to the public uh, available over the Internet. Um, finally, the other final item we've been addressing since the outset of this administration which has been very concerned about any environmental issue anywhere, and particularly the airport. Um, and at the airport, it was found that there are certain parts of the airport, in particular a burn pit, and I'll explain what that is in a moment, uh, where there is contamination by a chemical known as PFAS, which you have read about in the news. PFAS are called forever chemicals because it's very hard for them to, de they don't degenerate that easily over time. And there are two types of PFAS that are particularly of concern, of health concerns, PFOA and PFOS. How did the county wind up with those chemicals on its airport? Well, back in the 80s and 70s, uh, the Air National Guard operated at the airport, and they conducted fire training exercises using a certain type of firefighting foam called aqueous film-forming foam, AFFF as it's known, which contained this PFOA and PFOS. And it was discovered on this burn pit, and it was discovered it could be migrating in other parts of the airport. So uh, in conjunction with the Department of Environmental Conservation, we worked very closely with the department <coughs> to achieve a consent order that is now in the form of a brownfields agreement under the state's brownfields law to remedy, to remediate the PFAS issue at the airport. We've been working very closely with the DEC. We have some excellent consultants in First Environment and WSP who are experts in this area, and we are working to remediate any contamination at the airport that is caused by this firefighting foam that had PFOA and PFOS in it. The technology is evolving, so it's a real challenge because no one has come up with a solution to how to deal with some of these issues where there's contamination of soil and groundwater. But we've been working on this issue for the last four years, and we'll continue to work on it until it's resolved. So that's my report, County Executive. If there's any questions, I can answer them. Thank you very much. John Nona, our County Attorney. Uh, just to recap those three issues relative to the county airport, um, and not necessarily in the same sequence. We have uh, defended ourselves around the county government's prerogative to make a decision as to whether or not to grant any additional hangar space for a fixed-based operator, any of the fixed-based operators, and there are quite a few of them out there, um, and that those decisions are not made pursuant to prior contracts that were made before we took office, but rather are subject to review by the administration and the Board of Legislators and adoption uh, at the present time if we see fit to do that. And we may determine that we don't do that, but that is the prerogative of your elected officials today. They were not locked into place by past uh, arrangements, and <clears throat> that is what we've defended in court, uh, our prerogative to be able to have those discussions. The second lawsuit involves us launching a lawsuit to make sure that some of these uh, operators, charter operators, follow the rules as was negotiated back in the 1980s when uh, a lawsuit uh, created a stipulation with certain controls that govern uh, the individual travel uh, through commercial airlines and anything that functions like a commercial airlines at the airport. And then, of course, the third item that he referenced, again, is working to uh, remediate any of the pollution that uh, might have come from these firefighting foams that go back 40 years, 35 to 40 years ago, before it reaches the uh, drinking watershed of the Croton Reservoir. And that, that's very important, Kensco Reservoir. And that's a very important element. And, and the element of law involved in it is that there was a lawsuit by the state of New York and then a consent agreement between the state uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. But it's important to understand that we are trying very hard to fight to protect the environment of the airport and the prerogatives of, of us as a, as a government to make decisions that balance both the concerns that uh, those who live near the airport or under the flight path of the airport have, along with the value of the airport as an economic engine and a transportation hub. We put those things into balance, and we will go to court to defend our right to make those decisions based on that balance, rather than have uh, any entity that has its own uh, motive, its own benefit, uh, by uh, advocating for certain policy. And so, John, we thank you for you and your team 
using their legal skills to uh, help defend the county on those issues. Important for you to know that those things are happening. I also want to let you know that uh, we have a workforce that's roughly 4,500 employees in Westchester County, and quite a lot of them are represented by uh, organized labor unions. Those labor unions include uh, Civil Service Employee Association, CSEA, which is the largest cohort of uh, county employees. They involve also the Teamsters, organizing a certain group of managerial employees within the county. Uh, the New York State Nurses Association that organizes a contingent of nurses that work primarily in our health department, and then to some extent in a few other departments, Department of Social Services, uh, who are professional nurses and provide their services to Westchester County. Uh, the uh, police officers and the superior officers uh, through the various PBA organizations, both the county uh, PBA and the superior officers PBA, and they tend to bargain as a singular entity. Correction officers that work in our county jail facility, and uh, the Correction Officers Benevolent Association, COBA, and the superior officers, SOA, SOA, superior officers who are correction officers who have the higher rank uh, above the correction officers. And then there's also a component of investigators in the district attorney's office who are unionized as well. There is a sequence, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's a sequence in negotiations as we try to close the various contracts that are up. When we came into office in 2018, CSEA and the nurses both had open pending contracts that had not been negotiated. And there were negotiations that were put into place for the police officers and the correction officers that had not yet been ratified by the government. So we had the responsibility of tying those things down. Subsequent to that, we did close both nurses and CSEA contracts at the time during my first four years here. And uh, just this past year in 2021, we had a rollover extension of a contract for CSEA employees to take them through the end of December of 2022, this year. So CSEA is still working on a contract that will expire at the end of this year. Negotiations will be underway for the future years. A couple of months ago, we closed out the Teamsters contract, which had expired back at the end of 2020. And we had an extension to cover the years up to and including 2025. And so that contract is in place. It has been ratified by the union, approved by the Board of Legislators for those who are Teamsters within the Westchester County government. We have now uh, completed negotiations and it's been ratified by the nurses of Westchester County for a contract for those who are nurses in the county. You saw them up close and personal over the course of this pandemic. You saw them initially going out doing testing in people's homes in teams of two and three nurses. And then now you'll see them uh, manning many of the different satellite vaccination locations that Ken just alluded to when he was going through the list of different uh, entities. So that contract has just been uh, approved. Uh, been negotiated, approved by the nurses. It will go before the Board of Legislators for their scrutiny. And uh, the, the legislators under the Taylor Law can either accept or reject the contract. They cannot negotiate further. We try to negotiate out all of the different issues uh, before we present it to the Board. If the Board approves it, that will lock the nurses in. Their contract uh, would expire at the end of 21. And now the contract that, that has just been negotiated will cover 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26, a five-year scope. The reason for multiple-year contracts, and, and Supervisor Fulgenzi uh, can attest to this as a local government official, is you want to try to be able to predict the amount of labor costs that you have so you can properly budget for the future. You know what your labor costs are when you have an agreed upon contract. And of course, the individuals want the best possible arrangements for them. They want to see some additional money year over year. Certain other work benefits are a part of the negotiations. From our standpoint as a county, we want to be able to make sure that we have a workforce that is fairly compensated for what they do, is appreciated for what they do, because we expect them to do a tremendous amount of work and service to the people of Westchester County, our police officers, our correction officers, our nurses, right on down the line. So with this action and the nurses we have now uh, currently will be up to speed with three of the unions currently through the end of uh, this year and beyond. Uh, we are in talks right now with the police uh, officers benevolent association and there have been fruitful conversations. They are not yet complete. There are some open issues. We believe we can work through those issues and get to closure. We hope to do that sooner rather than later. Uh, and that will be followed by our negotiations with the correctional officers, the superior correctional officers, and then ultimately the district, uh, the DA investigators. If we can complete all of those over the course of this year, <coughs> excuse me, then we can project forward 
what our labor costs are when we plan the 23, 2023 budget, 2024 budget, and that hopefully will help us have the least possible uh, tax impact. Over the last three years, we've been able to cut county property tax level uh, levy in 2020's budget, 2021, and now in the 2022 budget. And uh, the union contracts, getting them negotiated fairly but also closed, uh, is a very important part of that process. And so we want to thank uh, uh, the nurse, uh, New York State Nurses Association representatives for their negotiation that helped us close that contract. And we'll keep you posted as the other ones go forward. Next issue I want to cover so that you have it, it's kind of a long update, but these are substantive things, is the work that you see going on at Playland Amusement Park. Playland's been the, uh, the conversation piece of the last few years, and in fact, it's one of the major holdings of Westchester County. It's one of the few that's not in Mount Pleasant, um, but uh, it's in uh, uh, the backyard of the city of Rye, and uh, Playland was created as a county park back in the late 1920s, and it, it upgraded what was then, you know, a much seedier usage of that beautiful land and, and made the first planned amusement park in the United States of America. Before there was Six Flags, before there was Disney, there was Playland Amusement Park. Just as the Bronx River Parkway was the first ever limited access highway in the United States of America, Westchester led the way then. It led the way with the first planned amusement park. Now, over the years, Playland has gone through many different iterations and different strategies uh, to try to deal with the changing times. And the changing times do change uh, the way people interact with uh, amusement. Uh, the opening up of the South uh, amusement parks in Florida that uh, took off in earnest in the 1970s and 80s, other regional parks in the Northeast that became more prominent, uh, changed the, the marketplace. Uh, for you, for going to a facility like Playland, where traditionally you had Coney Island, you had Palisades Amusement Park, that closed. Freedom Land was open for a few years in the 1960s, that closed. But Playland has survived. And of course, we had quite a discussion over governance of Playland over the last few years. Uh, an arrangement was made by my predecessor to um, have a, a private company manage it over a 30-year period of time. Uh, we've had some uh, some discussions, I'll keep it that way over the road, some litigation, uh, and now Standard Amusements, uh, as of December 1st, uh, at the very end of last year, has taken over the day-to-day -day management of the park. It is Standard Amusement that will make the decisions on rides, make the decision on pricing, make the decisions on food options. The county government will not be making those decisions day-to-day, -day, as we have for most of the last 40 years. However, we have a responsibility uh, because we still own the physical plant, and we also have a responsibility to maintain certain basic structures at the park. It might be that uh, Standard Amusements has the responsibility to determine what rides and bring rides in and invest capital on that side of the ledger, but Westchester County uh, has to invest in the overall infrastructure of the park and in some areas that have been neglected for more than a decade. And when you neglect these things for this long a period of time, it takes a lot of money to put them back uh, to right. But I just want to highlight that uh, we expect substantial completion for the 2022 season, uh, which will open up this spring. Uh, Standard will make the decision as the actual opening date. And uh, in it, there's some major projects that uh, we're in the process of trying to complete. <coughs> we have completely reconstructed Playland Pool. You may remember Playland Pool was a competition-sized pool. It had a very deep uh, end at, the, at, at one end of the pool and uh, was used for competitions. We've now shifted the competition element at the public pools over to the second pool at uh, Sp uh, Sprain Ridge down on Jackson Avenue in Yonkers. There you have two pools, one an activity pool for younger kids, and, and then we have a, uh, a, a pool that's uh, proper for competition, for adult lap swimming, and so forth. That is now the location that has been previously used at Playland because at Playland there's going to be a new pool structure along with the bathhouse. It, uh, it removes the existing pool. It brings in a family-style pool, which means a little less deep at the deep end, a little shallower so that mom can bring the kids in or dad can bring the kids in to splash around without having to worry about them being involved in a, in a, uh, a potentially more dangerous structure. There's rehabilitation and upgrades to the existing bathhouse. That project is a $20 million, almost a $21 million project. There's emergency infrastructure work that's going on at Playland. It's historic rehabilitation of the North and South Administration buildings, the buildings as you enter into Playland, uh, primarily to your right and then uh, across the corridor to the left, the rehabilitation of the main restroom, and then the cross-axis restroom facilities, which are right in the center of the park uh, at the midway point. 
There's an historic reconstruction of the Playland Towers uh, that uphold the various colonnades across, and the food facilities, and that overall, those projects together total $26 million of improvements. There's a second phase of infrastructure improvement which involves historic reconstruction of the South Mall colonnade. South Mall is closer to where you enter uh, the park. Uh, the historic rehabilitation of the former employee facility at Fountain Plaza, construction of new restroom at the East Cross Axis, uh, rehabilitation in this area, $22.5 million. There's a host of site improvements, reconstruction of Fountain Plaza, which is what you see when you walk in, what you, when you walk in the door, the reconstruction of the South Mall and the West Cross Axis walkways, construction of a new passive park behind the Playland Carousel, uh, the pool parking lot is going to be reconstructed as well. That's a cost of $11 million. These are substantial projects, but let me tell you, this place was neglected for a long, long time through a variety of administrations. Uh, who weren't sure of what the direction was going to be for Playland's future. Would we invest money? Should we not? Can it be sold off? And what the circumstances are. We've made a strong commitment. That strong commitment includes a new surveillance system for the cost of $3 million. And we've also put in a, uh, a new uh, electrical uh, building to handle the flow of electricity into the site. And uh, that switchgear building is very important. Well, that's on the west border of the park along the, uh, uh, the, park, the back part of the parking lot. All of these things were necessary for there to be a, a legitimate future for Playland. For those who wanted to see Playland saved, in quotation marks, this investment of $125 million of capital is the single biggest commitment to save Playland that we have seen in this county in decades, in decades. Now, the new management of the park will have the opportunity to try to take, with, with these renovations, uh, a, a management strategy in food and rides and uh, the other recreational components of it, and uh, we'll see how all that works in the future, but we think Playland's got a bright future. And we also think in the same way that we renovated the Sprain Ridge pools, in the same way that we saved the Miller House on, um, uh, on Virginia Road, the historic Washington headquarters facility, the same way that we've repaired the North County Trailway and now the South County Trailway, and the, the work that we intend to do at the Whiteman Mansion at Lenoir Preserve, the work we have uh, planned to do and budgeted to do at the historic Tarrytown Sleepy Hollow Lighthouse. All of those things are protecting assets in Westchester County. And there are more assets we have to look at going forward, the county center uh, and others. In every one of these cases, we have tried to uh, do what uh, has not been tackled over an extended period of time. And you know from your own home, if you uh, put off maintenance, if you put off a reconstruction project, the de deterioration only gets worse and the cost of repair only gets higher when you finally decide to do it on the assumption that you're not going to tear the whole thing down. And so we know that uh, it's a little bit of a frustrating time. There's some people who are concerned about what actual day play will open, when it opens, how many of the facilities are going to be available. Uh, and, and clearly on day one, there's still going to be work going on around us down there. But the overall commitment to this park is clear and it's profound. And it will represent a far better park for the long haul over the course of the next 20, 30 years with these projects done and then complemented by uh, the work uh, that we, we expect to come in the future. And that is a quick update on Playland. If you have other questions, you can certainly reach out to us and we'll be happy to address them for you. Uh, on the lighter side, Restaurant Week has arrived. It starts today, March 21st. Um, I'm still on my diet, so I don't know how much I'm going to personally be able to enjoy Restaurant Week, but it goes from March 21st till April 3rd, a little longer than um, uh, just a simple seven-day week. Uh, the restaurants who participate in this will have a fixed-price lunch and fixed-price dinners, $29.95 for lunch, $39.95 for dinner, and these are three-course dinners, and they are some of the finest restaurants in Westchester County. Now, it also includes restaurants outside of Westchester County in Rockland and Orange and Dutchess and Putnam counties. I think it goes up into Ulster and Columbia County as well. But this is an opportunity where it's getting a little nicer outside. You've been cooped up all winter. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to go out and enjoy some of the great restaurants that we have. And uh, this is a biannual event. It happens in the spring and also happens in the fall. And the participating restaurants usually get a boost of business, trial awareness, because the prices are structured a certain way. And then it gives you a place to come back to on your own time as you begin to enjoy new, uh, new efforts. And there's really an effort to try to get you to look at restaurants in other parts of Westchester. I live in a section of Westchester along the Sound Shore. I'm pretty familiar with the restaurants in the corridor from Portchester to New Rochelle. This is the time to drive up to North 
Salem, this is the time to uh, look at, uh, as, as Carl Fugenzi would say, look at those restaurants in Thornwood and Hawthorne and Sleepy Hollow and Pleasantville. Go into Yonkers. Fabulous restaurants at every corner. 55 Westchester residents are participating from Yonkers to Yorktown, and uh, we encourage you to go online. There is a, a website where you can make a reservation. It's valleytable.com slash HVRW slash restaurants. Hopefully it's up on your screen. If it isn't, you can go to our website and you'll be happy to see it. And this is a great opportunity for you to see that. You're getting out. We spread our elbows. Hopefully uh, COVID stays where it is and continues to drop. And you'll, you'll enjoy some of the beautiful parts of Westchester. There are restaurants that overlook the Hudson and that are all throughout this county. We also want to point out that we're about a month away from beginning our annual salute to seniors. And this is a classic example when you get life gives you a lemon, you make lemonade out of it. Salute to seniors was usually a singular event held at the Westchester County Center in the main room where, where basketball is played <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me, graduations and so forth are held. Because of COVID and using the county center for uh, vaccination and testing purposes, uh, we had to take these outdoors and break them into small groups of people because you couldn't fit all of them in any one location. And so uh, our Office for the Aging created a series of regional uh, local expos done outdoors with a picnic style setting. And those will be coming up in the month of May. And last year when we did this, they were well received. It was a shorter commute for the seniors in each of these different areas of the county. They love being outdoors and they love being able to uh, be with their friends uh, given the, the COVID uh, outbreak, which, you know, is still with us at some level. So we'll mention that on May 4th, Wednesday, we're at Sprain Ridge Park, aforementioned Sprain Ridge Park on Jackson Avenue. Uh, for the Yonkers area, we're in central Westchester at the Ridge Road Park on Wednesday, May 11th. That's in Hartsdale, Greenberg. Uh, very nice location. Uh, we'll be in northern Westchester at Croton Point Park, one of our most beautiful facilities located in Croton on Hudson, right uh, near the train station. And then uh, on the 25th of May, also Wednesdays, all Wednesdays, we're at Glen Island Park on the Sound Shore uh, in New Rochelle, right by the water. Uh, there's a number to make a reservation, 218-3968. Box lunch is provided with each reservation, and you can ride free on the Beeline bus system to get to any of these locations. Uh, there'll be more information about this uh, on our website. And then finally, uh, as, as proud as I am to be a resident of the city of Rye over many years, and, and my neighbors and friends in Rye often talk about my roots growing up in a different part of the county in Mount Vernon. I'm a graduate of Mount Vernon High School, class of 1970, and uh, we are always very proud of having an excellent basketball program. There are other high schools that have done well over the years, but Mount Vernon Knights have been crowned state champion many times, and it's happened again. The Class AA Boys Basketball State Championship occurred this weekend, and the Mount Vernon Knights are the state champions in Class AA. They finished the season undefeated. The 78 team, the 91 team, and the 2000 team were also undefeated state champions. Now Mount Vernon High School Knights can add their fourth undefeated state championship. Congratulations to Bob Samino, who's the coach. I actually went to high school with Bob. And also the tournament MVP, senior forward DeMarley Taylor. And uh, as we know over the years, many NBA players have come out of Westchester County, Elton Brand, uh, Bernard Toon from other schools all across the county. Mount Vernon has produced Gus Williams, Ray Williams, Lowe's Moore, Earl Tatum, uh, and then at later times, Ben Gordon. Uh, and so we're very proud of that program. We're very proud of the city of Mount Vernon, and in this case, Mount Vernon High School Knights. So that gives you a little idea of what's happening, some lighthearted things relative to Restaurant Week and salute to seniors and saluting boys high school basketball and then some more serious issues about union contracts, Playland, uh, the numbers on COVID, and uh, gives you a little flavor of just what kind of a mosaic we have in Westchester County. I'm going to check with Lisa Reyes to see if we have any questions from the press. We do not. I put them all to sleep with a long report. My apologies. Uh, but if there are any members of the press who want to follow up on any of these issues, feel free to call us at 995-2900, ask for the communications department. And Lisa or Catherine Chaffee, one of our uh, communications managers, will be happy to work with you and talk with you. In the meantime, we will be back next Monday at 2 o'clock, give you an update on some additional issues. As other issues arrive during the course of the week, we'll be happy to interact with you. But I want to thank, once again, Town Supervisor Carl Fulgenzi from Mount Pleasant to join us. Next week, we'll have one of his colleagues from one of the other villages, towns, or cities to join us here, and they can give their report. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again a week from today. I'm George Latimer, County Executive. Stay safe, and we'll see you in a week.